So I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, we're absolutely delighted today uh, to have Sebastian Rutz, uh, who is the Director of Academic IT for IT Services at the University of Oxford, uh, and Gabriel Bodar, who is a researcher in digital epigraphy at the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. And they're going to be talking to us today about the uh, the Standards for Networking Ancient uh, Prosopographies uh, project, uh, Data and Relations in greco roman Names. So, take it away, Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, we're, um, uh, as Charlotte says, going to um, talk about the uh, Snapdragon project. Um, it's... Um, Particularly nice that Charlotte introduced it, as um, if I remember correctly, she's the one who came up with the acronym SNAP for this as we were throwing around words like networking and standards and prosopography and ancient, and she figured out you could make a word out of that, a word better than pans. Um, so, so that's great. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about the background to this project at um, the beginning and where the project comes from and what it's trying to do. Um, Sebastian's then going to talk in more detail about what the actual aims and objectives of the project are and what the methods um, we're taking to achieve them are. Um, and I'm going to end with uh, a few minutes just talking about the state of play, how far we've got with this project and where we hope to go with it in the future. Um, as some of this may get quite technical um, and as some of it may be quite um, extemporized, um, please do feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point. Um, I don't think we need to have this as a, a solid, you know, us not shutting up for an hour followed by, followed by formal um, hands raised questions. So please, please interrupt whenever you like. Um, so the, the origins of this collaboration, um, basically I could, I could give a whole paper on this so I'm just going to skip through very quickly. The, um, this collaboration, um, this idea, project idea, really came from a discussion we started having with um, several people who were working on the Sharing Ancient Wisdoms project, um, many of whom are in this room now, um, about how do we um, create uh, uh, an authority for people for the ancient and medieval world. What do, we, um, what do we say when we've got a person turns up in a text and we want to say this person um, is this particular person with the name Alexander, other than the other 900 or 900,000 or how many other people called Alexander there may be in the ancient world that I could be talking about. And so um, the answer to that in the non-technical world is you point to a prosopography. You say here, here's a prosopography, this is the Alexander referred to by the lexicon of Greek personal names on page 212, volume 2. Um, but um, in a digital world, we want to be able to do slightly more than that. We want to be able to say, um, it, using a linked data mechanism to be able to point to a URI and say this, this person is this exact person, um, regardless of which um, particular uh, piece of bibliography describes them. Um, and so we, we started talking about how this, how this could, could work. There are one or two of the many, many um, prosopographies that exist for the ancient medieval world. One or two of those are online and um, have uh, URIs for individual um, persons. Um, we started looking around to try and find how many of these it was true for, and we found quite a few um, prosopographies which have some kind of digital presence. Um, many, but not all of those, are online. You can see this, this is a discussion we started to have on the digital classicist mailing list, and we, um, we collated this list in the wiki. This is only about the first half of the page. It goes on a bit further. Um, and um, as you can see, many of these are online. A very few of these have URIs already. Um, almost none of them are already in RDF. So we had to, which, which means that it's something that we can connect to the semantic web. Um, the, um, so we started to think about what it would take to, to build, um, and even if many of these have been online, what if the same person occurs in three of these prosopographies, which one do you point to, to say this is the person I'm talking about? You could point to them all. Um, but we wanted to try and come up with some way to make this slightly more um, uh, a useful and, and easy point of access to, to the classicists um, who want to be able to link their texts to, um, to, the, uh, to the authority. So we started thinking about how to, how to bring these together. So we started having this conversation based on this list that we started to be put together. Um, the, um, the Linked Ancient World Data Institute, which took place over two years from 2012 to 13, um, brought together a lot of people interested in working on linked data and RDF um, for classics in the ancient world generally, um, and there was, a, there was a particular special interest group within that on people talking about 
um, people um, and how we, um, how we link together um, cross-biographical information. Um, and so we ended up, as a result of these several conversations, um, bringing together a small group of people um, to start with, um, who were um, the, the, the six people listed on here, um, who, um, who we felt had between them the, the interest, the expertise, and the access to the data to, to actually get started and actually build the beginnings of a distributed authority of ancient persons um, using this technology called IDF, which um, Sebastian's going to show some examples of in a moment. The, the basic principle, um, to, to move on to the, the aims of the project just for a second, um, the, the basic principle of this was very, very closely based on the model of ancient geography. So, um, for ancient geography, um, it's slightly simpler in that there is one uh, primary authority that people use um, in analog form. This was the Barrington Atlas of the Greek and Roman world. In digital form, this is the Pleiades project which is largely based on the Brampton Atlas, but has been expanded over the last 10 years to include a lot more information, a lot more precise coordinates, a lot more name variants, a lot more links um, from one thing to another, and links to other data sets, and links from other data sets. Um, so, so there is this one um, uh, authority, and on top of this, a, um, a project called um, Pelagios has developed um, standards and um, recommendations for how to link from a text, from a archaeological record, from a coin um, information uh, card, or whatever, to um, the, the URI for a place associated with, so a place quoted in that text, the find place listed in the archaeological record, the, uh, the, the location of the mint um, in a coin record, etc. Um, to the, the place URI in Pleiades. So when, when we say in our record, this object was found at Alexandria, we know which of the 29 Alexandrias in the ancient world it was referring to. And so the Pelagios have the, the mechanism for recommending how to do that. And we wanted to do exactly the same thing. The, um, the difficulty behind that being that there is not yet a Pleiades for, um, for ancient people. So we ended up thinking of our project in terms of having to put together a Pleiades part, where we bring together the existing digital prosopographies and make a single authority, followed by a Pelagios part, where we recommend to people how they go about linking to this, um, this virtual prosopography um, um, thereafter. Um, so that's, that's the basics, that's where we started. Um, Sebastian's now going to talk in a bit more detail about what um, we tried to do um, to achieve this end. Um, and, um, and I'll, come back, I'll come back at the end to talk a little bit about um, where we are on the road to, to achieving all of that. Okay, um, some basics to start off with what SNAP was trying to do. SNAP is not trying to create a new prosopography, an all-encompassing one ring to bind them all for the ancient world. It's trying to produce an index to ancient world people. So those of you who are researchers may be familiar with things like ORCID, the International Registry of Current Researchers. Um, something more like that than a new prosopography. So when I show the examples of what we're getting from our data and our data partners, see that, that we're just modelling those aspects of people which we need to put in there to help with disambiguation and with relationships to being people. So don't look at it, examples and say, oh, but you haven't, meant, you haven't put a thing in there about what their profession is, about what their sex is in there. Um, Keep, concentrate on the idea that it is merely a collection, uh, a single registry of uh, uh, index to other things. We're about annotation, not cataloguing. So we're trying to provide an environment in which people can talk about the relationship between this person and that person, i.e. they are the same person, they are not the same person, X is the daughter of Y, and so on. So it's a place to store the conclusions of disambiguation, largely. On a technical level, we're talking here about linked open data and the semantic web. Um, it's difficult to, to, to deal with this because it's a mindset and a technicality, and Gabby's already touched on part of this. The idea that we are not talking about discrete publications in the old sense, but about putting data out there which is available to do things with other data. And if you're not familiar with this concept, people often talk about it in terms of qualities of data in terms of stars. First star is you make something available on the web, we all do that. 
The second star is that you get more points if you make it available as data, not as pictures. On the third star, you get it if you make it available in non-proprietary software. The fourth star is if you open standards to do it. Um, and the fifth star is if you actually join up your things with other people. So you don't just put a list of your people up there, but you say they relate to other people. This is the little world we're trying to live in, um, where we are not talking about absolute publications, we're talking about data resources on the web. So how do we, you know, Gabby and I and the other partners are not going to sit there and collect together all the stuff from around the world. This is predicated on the idea that people want to join in this. They want to contribute their uh, data, a summary of their data, so that it's in a place you can link together prosopography A with prosopography B. So I want to go through these five things, the five routes into Snapdragon of putting a prosopography online, contributing a summary of it to Snapdragon, and coming about co-referencing relationships between people and annotating text. And I'm going to concentrate mainly on part two there of what it would mean to put material into Snapdragon. So I think that will clarify a lot of questions about what is and isn't in there. So the first part of it is collecting together data without trying to join it up. So we started off by saying, let's base this on three large collections, lexical and Greek personal names, Trismegistos and, and PIR, Prosopophia Peri Romani. Um, and I'm sure all of you will be familiar with at least one of these resources. Um, and this gives you some reminder of some idea of the scale of this, so that LGPN has 300,000 people, Trismegistos has 367,000, and there are 10,000 in PIR. So that's our basis. Let's ingest all of those data sources we know about, which we know are widely used, we know are not grotesquely overlapping, um, and then let's ask other people to join in and see how we can uh, link them together. That's not to say that those three projects are all identical in terms of their data quality. So I just want to say something about the characteristics of those three data sources. So the le le lexicon of good personal names, for example, has on the good side that it is um, on the web. You can point to a stable URI which tells you about that person. Not quite so easy to link that back to the published book if that's what you're used to using. Um, but the material on the web at least is all there and is stable. And it does deal correctly with the modelling of names distinct from people. So although it starts off as a lexicon of Greek personal names, there is a name Apollonius, it also distinguishes between the people who are called Apollonius. Um, and it deals correctly with things like dating and places. But there are a number of problems with it. The reason I go through this is because I also want to talk about what partner datas might contribute and some of the data sets might contribute and some of the problems they might have. And you'll see these examples in the base data set. So for instance, there are relationships in LGPN. It says Apollonius, father of um, Cartus, <coughs> but it's only textual. You can interpret it because you're humans from that remark there, father of Cartos, but a uh, computer can't follow that. It doesn't know which Cartos. The references in there are textual only, so they are traditional bibliographical references. If you want to know why that we believe this person exists, you have to go and look at LSAG, second edition, page 132, number 33. I've no, no idea what that is. It's almost certainly a published inscription. Some of you are thumbing through your copies and thinking, I know that one. It's uh, not called Polonius at all. But it doesn't, you can't go from here to an online publication of NSAG and check that you believe that, that in, see a transcription of that inscription and check that you believe this name is right and the dating is right and so on. Similarly, things like name variants are only given in textual form. So some people, um, well, some people use PowerPoint, which gets the encoding of the characters wrong, a little red bit there, but we won't talk about that. Um, so it, it does things, it comes from an older generation which is referencing things uh, as text for humans to follow. So it's easy for you to see that some people, there are, there are, there are versions of this name spelt slightly differently. Um, it's difficult to get from there to a search for the name Charto. And it's not fully dereferenceable. My D word I'll come back to later and try and explain to you what I mean by dereferenceable. PIR is a much older project. Well, it has a much longer history. 
um, a, 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 and is not entirely online at the moment, it's a slightly contentious issue, but it does have the great advantage that it is well trusted, established. People trust PIR identifiers and you trust there's this ambiguation in there. If it says that this Claudius is not that Claudius, you're inclined to believe it because somebody's beavered away to say so. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you the backup information by which you can test that. So it doesn't give you the sources for the attestation. It just says there's this man called Claudius. Um, I mean, in, in the um, digital version of it that we have, it's not dereferenceable, come back to the D word in a minute, it doesn't really include relationship information in what we have, and it doesn't model names distinct from people. Trismegistos is a whole different kettle of fish, and it's, um, it's a well-established project, um, but has, is much more active than the other two, um, and is much closer to being uh, a usable digital resource. It has established IDs. It links directly to the source. So this man, Pecusios, you can see the manuscript, that the, with the papyrus or the inscription, whatever it is, um, presumably a papyrus, where he's attested, and you can go from there to papyri.info and actually read the transcribed papyrus and check out that you believe in this reading of Pecusius. And it has linked relationships, it has modelling of name variants, and it makes this cl clear distinction between the idea of a name, which I see, I see the name of Polonius, I believe that therefore there was a person who happens to have the name of Apollonius, and there are and, and one or more attestations to link this person to that name. But again, it's not fully dereferenceable. What do I mean by dereferenceable? I'm talking about exposing the data, the URLs for each of these component parts in a way which computers can follow. So I'm giving an example here of the British Museum um, from their person data set, which has its own issues, um, but does this correctly. But if you go to that first URL, you can get from there as a computer to the next one. You don't have to have a human read through a web page and say click on the third link from the bottom in order to get that per from that person to the record about their name. And having got and to get similarly from there to the record about the person. I'm probably not explaining this very well, um, but I need to keep coming back to this idea that you want a system where computers follow links, not humans. The way we do that is provi by providing an ambiguous, um, very highly formalized markup data in there using RDF. And all the, so all the examples I'm going to give you in a moment of using RDF are towards this aim, getting away from the human using very fixed, simple rules to follow links. So the fundamental bit about Snapdragon, what we spent most of our time in so far, is getting data partners to work, having to, to model what it is we're trying to achieve and then get people to provide data in that form. So somebody comes along to us and says, well, actually, I've got a load of names, of, I've got a load of data about people. Um, I know everything there is to know about 3rd century Alexandria or 5th century Sicily. Recorded all, I know, I'm the world expert on this subject. So these are some of the stages they might be going through in order to play nicely with the world of the semantic web and a, and a, and a modern prosopography. There's a fundamental thing we have to look at, first of all, as to whether when somebody says, I've got everything there is to know about 5th century Sicily, is what have you got? Do you have a list of all the names in there, or do you have a list of all the people in there? Not quite the same thing. To say I have transcribed all the inscriptions from 5th century Sicily and extracted all of the names, identified all of them, does not give you a prosopography. It gives you a catalogue of all the names that occurred in inscriptions from 5th century Sicily. To join them all up, to say that this Apollonius is that Apollonius, I believe, on so-and-so grounds, is getting towards a prosopography. And a set of attestations, so having arrived at I think I've got 5,000 names occurring in 5th century Sicilian inscriptions, I believe these boil down to only 200 people, then I can link the 5,000 to the 200 by attestations by saying person 1, 2, 3, 4 picks up the name Apollonius because they are in that inscription. The second thing that is not immediately obvious to some people, um, which is that you actually have to identify what you've got. 
I build up my spreadsheet of these 5,200 people in 5th century Sicily. It's great. It's everything I want. It contains all the information I need to write a beautiful article. It doesn't actually give you a unique identifier to refer to them. When I look through this and I see the 23rd name is Apollonius, I need a way of explicitly saying the 23rd name. And I need a way to refer to your data set. And that's what goes up to make a URN, a URI. The name of the data set and the name of your identifier within it. So it's a, very, it's a trivial step, but uh, quite a few people don't have data in that form. Then you've got to go one further, and there's no point putting the stuff in, there's no point saying, I've got a spreadsheet back on my computer. I need to be able to point to that spreadsheet if my computer's going to follow it and link together your person and my person. So you've got to put this stuff online so that when you say the name of your data set is XYZ and the number of your person is 23, there's got to be an actual dereferenceable URL which I, a computer, can go and follow. To get there is okay, then you're almost certainly going to be doing some data cleanup. In modern contexts, you haven't distinguished between a forename and a surname, for example. You've just put the two together, separated by a comma. If you're going to supply a computer with a forename and a surname, it wants to know which is which. It doesn't want to be told, well, just go and look for the comma in the space, it's obvious. It wants it to be even more obvious than that because it's stupid. Therefore, you're going to have to take these things apart and put them in different places. When you've done all that and cleaned it up a bit and you've normalised, for instance, your dates, there's no point telling me that your person is Hellenistic. What does Hellenistic mean? Um, you know, cue discussion for the next half hour of what we mean by Hellenistic. And let's not even get to what you mean by places. Having done that normalisation, and I'm sure somebody will pick me up on this later, you've then got to put the data into a form that I can ingest it so that it's comparable with my data. When I say my, I mean Mr. Snap. I am Mr. Snap at this point. And in case you're wondering, those of you who like your breakfast cereals, the follow-up projects, there is already expansions in place for crackle and pop. <laughs> um, and then you've got to expose that data and make it available to us. So these are some of the people who have bravely have bravely said, well, okay, give it a go then. Um, got some stuff there. You know, the, the type, when I say, when I say fifth century uh, Sicilians, I don't mean that, I mean Roman emperors, I mean Syriac saints, I mean um, Sicilian officers, I mean uh, people in Cyrenaic, uh, 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 Attic inscriptions online, and so on. And you can see that this is a huge great mishmash here of things where we're almost certainly got several people cataloging the same ancient individuals for different reasons and where they're completely separate geographically and chronologically, um, and they, they will abut together rather than merge. So these are some of the resources that people in this room will be familiar with using that we want to include. Some of the things that might be wrong in this, um, you might not be identifying the records, you might not be online yet, as I say, you may have no record to primary sources, and you may not be distinguishing names from persons. That little example I give there is just from the um, international authority file, largely in the modern world, VIAF, which does have representation from the ancient world, but not actually in an incredibly useful way. It asserts that there was somebody called Thucydides, and it knows about Thucydides because he wrote books. The idea that you might say, why do we know there's somebody called Thucydides um, is, is left open because it's obvious everybody knows who Thucydides was. I put this in so that you can't read it. Um, so I'm going to switch over to there and show you a tune spreadsheet. And apologies if the author of this is here. I don't really want to talk about the content here. I want to give it as an example of the type of stuff of a very rich piece of data which we're going to have to discuss. And you can see some of the issues here when I talk about uh, trying to decide what it is that you've got. So this is a, a collection of data about Romans. Um, and it deals with things in a, in a specific way for a specific purpose. So it divides people up into their nomen, their prinomen, and their cognomen, um, and patron name, things like that, which is good, but you see when we come to look at names later, we're going to have to make a decision about whether we deal with the structure of names or, or not worry about it. So each one of these piece, people is a disambiguated individual, um, but saying a lot more, sort of more about the names than we want to know. It also says useful things like their date, 
but they're dated in a form which is difficult to map to other dates. So it's correct in the context to say the date is Ciceronian, that's good and useful information. It's a little bit difficult if you're trying to say, I want all the people from the first century BC. You and I know that we should include the Ciceronians in there, um, but we've got to do something explicit to, to make it so. Things like locations, this is where if this project was talking to Pleiades, it would say the location is good, we know about this person because they're from Pompeii, which Pompeii is that then? Is that Pompeii in Georgia founded 20 years ago or is it that Pompeii that was uh, buried underneath the volcano and so on? Um, and at the end, the same problem as the lexicon of Greek personal names. We know why we believe this person existed because there's an inscription about them or well, they're mentioned in Cicero, um, which is three different types here, if you can read this. One of them says it's from an inscription, CIL 1.2980, great, I, somebody once wrote this person's name in a bit of stone. Another one is because Cicero mentions this person. He says, I was coming back from the bars that day and I met a man selling, selling bagels and his name was um, whatever it was. Um, another one is because Hatsfield in 1999 said he was. So it, it's, a, it's a one remove. Why did Hatsfield assert that this person existed? I don't want to go on about that, but it's an example of incoming data, and you can see what, that one has to do things to that to fit it into the model I'm now going to talk about. So I need to give you some idea of what type of things we're recording in SNAP here. I'm doing this in by giving you a list of the types of object that we wish to record. If you're familiar with RDF, you might want to read this and stare at it more carefully. If you're not familiar with RDF, what you want to be looking at there is the idea that in the current set of data we've got, these are the types of object that we're recording. We are recording persons. We are recording personal names. We are recording citations. We are recording name attestations and person attestations, and we are recording some relationships. So currently we have four types of relationships that we've got in our records, that somebody is somebody else's spouse, their father, their mother, their son, and their daughter. This is all expounded in a Snapdragon cookbook, where we go into this more formally. But I wanted to show it to give you an idea of the, the richness or not richness that we're dealing with. So again, I want to stress that we're not here trying to describe everything you can say about somebody in the ancient world. We're trying to put together a minimal subset that you might wish to contribute information about because it will help other people um, establish whether their person is the same as a person they can see in SNAP. Similarly, these are the types of things that you can say about those objects to say that this person is associated with that person this person has that relationship to that text. Some examples of what you might say. Um, this is your first exposure to well, this talk, I hope not entirely, to actual bits of RDF. So the blue stuff at the bottom is making an assertion. So the first line of that blue stuff asserts that that URL there, LGPN OXAC ARC ID V version 5A-35652 hash this, that uniquely identifies a person and SNAP is asserting that this is an example of an object of type of person in the little world that we've defined. So we have defined a world that says you can divide up the world into 15, 16 things. This is one of number one, a person. And there are examples there also from, from Trismegistos and PIR. So that's the fundamental thing that we do, say this identifier we claim is a person. It's not, it's something, you're thinking that's just so trivial, um, it's not true. It's getting out, but it is establishing that we are asserting to you that we have 300,000 people, 600,000 people here. We're not just saying it, we're giving you the, the, form, the formal um, statements. We're also saying that these, that there are such things as names in the world. So we are saying that there is a name Suntuke, and all. There, that name exists in the world, I claim. And I'm giving it to you in Greek and in Latin. I am claiming that there is a, a name Appius Annius Gallus. Um, 
That's all I'm saying about it. It exists in the world. I am then saying something much more interesting. I am saying, going back to that person I just talked about, that identifier there, that name there, there's a relationship between them. That this person um, has decided to partake of that name. So my name, Sebastian, exists out there in the world. Many of you, if you're lucky enough to be called Sebastian as well, also partake of it. But I, the unique individual, have a relationship to that name. And this set of gibberish, unreadable gibberish on the screen behind me, is us saying that in a formal way. That's what we're trying to do in Snapdragon, is get you to commit yourself to saying that in, 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 in computer speech rather than human speech. It would be much easier to say Sebastian, son of Philip, but it would take 16 lines of this to say that. We also want to say, well, we also, as, as a shorthand, we get a bit bored actually referring to um, LGPN 5A35652 because not many people can remember it. He's actually better known as Apollonius, let's face it. Um, and he probably has a Greek, a, an Arabic version of that as well. Um, that's some saying that when we get things from people, it's actually helpful to have a human readable version of the names in there. The two other things we're interested in at this point are not because we need them, because we've made that fundamental assertion that a person exists and they are of that name. But in practice, most of us like to be reassured something about the two other common properties, which is, well, when was all this happening? Is this 5th century BC or is it Byzantium in the 7th century? And where, where was all this? Are we talking about Egypt here or are we talking about um, the Low Countries? So, for most of our people, we would expect to have the notion of an associated date. It's a bit like this, the, 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 shorthand for, the short form of a name. When you saw a slide at the beginning of this, who's talking today? Gabriel Badar, King's College, London. It reminds you that it's that Gabriel Badar, rather than the more famous Gabriel Badar, who was the first Brazilian aviator. He wasn't called Gabriel Badar, was he? I can't remember his name. Um, but it's the Gabriel Badar from England in the 20th century, in the same way that we want to say that that person um, from Lexcrete, person of names, it's that bloke from the second century AD, and it's that bloke who basically comes from Chios. It narrows them down a bit. So we will ask our data contributors to put in information like this, not because we're asking Snap to store all of this and be the authoritative record for it, we want to put it in there so that we can start doing minimal analysis of this to see if we can disambiguate people. If we took all of your prosopographies, mushed them all together, and we ended up with, shall we say, five million person claims, that's great. But the chances are quite high that a third of those are overlaps. And we've got A, overlaps, and B, are linked, are some of these people are linked to each other. The chance that we know about five million people in the ancient world and we know nothing else about them in their relationships to each other is very, very small. Um, so we're trying to build up a collection that does something useful and Gabby's going to come back to this briefly later. Now, if you thought the previous bits of gibberish were scary and unreadable, this bit is even worse. Um, and I'll, I will attempt to disambiguate this, not disambiguate, explain it, don't use really silly long words. What this is saying is that Trismegistos establishes there is a person, number 181. He has um, some bonds. These are pointing to statements where somebody has asserted a relationship. So we do not say that person 181 is the father of person 182. We do it by an intermediary claim because by doing that we give a context whereby we can establish authority and uncertainty. Just to, because somebody will say this at the end, what about uncertainty? We're giving a, we don't have examples of it here, but we're given a container within which that would be expressed. So there is an intermediate little box which says that this person has a bond and the bond is of type son of 
and pointing to another person and that little box has a place for dating, comments, authority and so on. And as will be obvious from the text here, I don't have space in the margin to explain all of this. But basically it says this bloke was married to that bloke. Well, probably not this bloke was married to that bloke because... Well, yeah. I've tried to, I, I'm deliberately showing sort of code examples in here because it reflects the reality of what SNAP has got to. It has got lots of things like this. It has amassed vast quantities of data within there um, from these different disparate data sources, from the three primary ones and starting to come in from the others. So currently, for instance, we've got stuff from the British Museum people and, and, and ancient people from VIA and others are being prepared. And we've got this great unadulterated mass of stuff coming in. What we do with it then, when we've got your assertions about all of those people, we make a second layer of assertions which initially simply mirror um, the first lot. So when I say there is a person, Trismegistos says there is a person, that creates two snap people. By creating snap people, it gives us a context in which we can say that these people are identical and making a third person who is the combination of those two. Um, and Faith at the back will take great delight in explaining this to us later if any of you have got questions on it because it drives some of us absolutely crazy, some of these ideas. But, but that idea that we take all the individuals, we initially mimic them by giving them new SNAP identifiers and then we start to merge together SNAP identifiers is the key aspect of the project. So we ingest 5 million identifiers, 3 million come out of disambiguated people, and those are the people that we want other projects to refer to. Those are the people in the equivalent of ORCID. I, I wanted to show some more code examples of how one starts contributing and building on top of SNAP. So we've got a load of people come in, we've given them a SNAP identifier, then we provide a notation by which you can, you can say that you think A and B are the same person. And at that point, you will supply who you will say who you are, publisher, this is the project or the person that made that claim, the reason why you did it, um, and what your evidence is. Why would you, and under what circumstances would you be asserting co-reference? Um, there's a number of possibilities here, ranging from the, from the pretty certain to the really quite unlikely. So the most likely circumstance is that actually it's pretty obvious that we've got the same person because we both use the same sources. We both refer to the same inscription and we picked out this person called Apollonius. Um, and you could see this because we both refer to the same primary publication of it. End of. Plainly they merge together. Um, quite in other cases, there's two separate, separate bits of data, but there's a third, which in different places, but there's a third bit of data which makes it absolutely clear these are the same people, and there's really not much ambiguity about it. Then it starts getting vaguer. There's the inferred identity, which is something where we hope that the Snapdragon dataset will let people do more of this, is that, you know, you've said to somebody on Kios in 333 BC called Apollonius, and I've said the same thing. You know, they're probably the same person even though there isn't any formal link between them. Then there's, getting vaguer still, hypothesized identity. The chances are these people are the same person. Um, all of the contextual evidence suggests that the chances of there, be, there being two um, people making statues in this place at the same time is not very great with the same name, so it's a fair bet they're the same person you'll want to attach your credibility to that because it's a claim you're going to be, uh, other people may disagree with. Then there's the, um, the idealised identity where actually this is probably what lots of us do. You know, it would be actually be jolly nice if they were the same person, wouldn't it? It would make it very neat um, if this person was that person's father and that, would, that meant his things were the same. This, the, the type of things one might, reasons one might assert co-reference. And similarly, you might assert relationships between people. I'm not going to talk about the text stuff because I want to move on to this point. Um, because the, that last point about um, annotating texts in the way that Gabby described that Pelagios project is successfully done, of saying, let's go through and enrich our digital classical texts and, and other texts with links directly to Pleiades 
um, so that they can be used together is something that SNAP uh, aims to get involved in, but we don't have anything to report about that at the moment. So I will um, uh, very quickly um, uh, talk a little bit about where, where we've got to then with, with SNAP, what we, what we hope to do, uh, well, what we hoped to do at the beginning of uh, the project, how, how much of that we've done, and what more we'd like to do um, beyond the scope of the, of the current project. Um, so we've started off thinking about um, some of the, uh, the research questions that could be asked of this data, um, and um, of, um, of the kind of work that, that can be done to enrich this data. And the three, um, the three main kinds of research um, that we've thought about doing here um, include, um, so the data creation um, and discovery, which was part of our project, and um, this was something that Mark DePowell um, was in charge of, and he's been doing named entity recognition across mostly Roman inscriptions, um, and um, he had, um, so before the start of this project, he already had these uh, 450,000 name references, of which he'd identified 367,000 individuals, um, uh, extracted from some, what, 60,000 papyri. Um, so he was going to try and run a very similar process across 400,000 Latin inscriptions, Roman inscriptions, um, and see how many names came out of that, presumably millions. Um, but so this, this is work that's ongoing. Um, he has, he's extracted the names, I don't know exactly how many, but, but certainly a, a great number. Um, what he hasn't done and what he doesn't intend to do this year is go through and disambiguate each and every um, person that is being referred to in that. That's, that's a much bigger task than a task for someone else um, at, this, at this point. We want to do um, two things. Um, so two kinds of co-reference. The one kind is where Mark has found three million names in Latin inscriptions and we want to say these nine are one person. Um, and the other is the kind that Sebastian's just been talking about, which is um, uh, reducing the number of doubles um, in the SNAP data set by linking together this person in lexicon of the personal names and this person in the Trismegistos data set. Um, and for, um, uh, for the purposes of, of the internal work, so the work that we, the Snapdragon team, intend to do is only the first of the kinds of um, linking that, um, that Sebastian described. So where it's unambiguous that these two references refer to the same person, these two different databases are describing the same person because they're clearly describing the same, uh, the same record, the same reference, the same attestation. There's no ambiguity in that. It's, it's not really, you don't really have to make an academic assertion that we think these two are the same person um, because the two people, um, uh, the, 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 everything behind the reference is the same. Um, so we, we, we intend to do that, and we intend to do that semi-automatically uh, semi um, as, as part of the process. And then, as, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, we want to, to have come up with ways to do some of the more speculative things that, um, that Sebastian's described. Um, and so the, the third um, research question that we've um, thought about um, is um, whether social network analysis might be something that is um, useful um, uh, well, both, both is something that our new, much larger, um, collated data set might be useful for, um, and something that whether social network analysis might be um, able to, as it has been used um, in the past, um, to spot likely co-references between, um, between the same person referred to multiple times. And this is, this is work that, um, that uh, you heard about uh, here two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, um, from, from Silke and um, that other people have been doing um, um, based, based partly on the Trismegistos data set, which is one of, one of our data sets. So uh, that the, the, the moment that the problem seems to be that, um, that of course in order to do social network analysis you need all sorts of relationship information about the links between people and we don't currently have that kind of information stored in um, the SNAP data set. Um, a lot of the kind of information that might be used to generate links between people we're, we're just not going to, going to ingest at all. Um, but even the bare minimal relationship information, this person is the son of that person, this person is the sister of that person, um, just hasn't, hasn't been ingested, hasn't been recorded yet. So, um, so this is something that we'll have to think about and talk about a lot more 
um, as we as we go forward. Um, so just to, to formally um, sort of check off where we've got to. Um, so these are the tasks which were our um, our uh, the task list. This is what we promised we would do um, during the uh, calendar year 2014 um, for the Snapdragon project that the AHRC uh, generously gave us um, some £80,000 to, to work on. Um, and we said we would, so we would build an ontology, and Sebastian showed some of the results of that earlier. We would have a first version of the cookbook so people could start trans creating their own RDF in our format. We would ingest the lexicography person names of Trismegistos and the PIR um, datasets um, into the SNAP format. We would ingest the data set from at least a few of the several partner projects that we identified. These weren't core members of the Snapdragon project team, but they're people who we hope to get in there. We would identify as many as possible co-references within our data, so where the same person is referred to in two different records. Um, we would build some um, APIs and other services over the top of the data, which would um, allow uh, the, the, the finding of um, various kinds of information um, and the querying of the data set um, via a slightly more uh, user-friendly interface than, than um, this language called Sparkle, which is used to um, search across um, uh, RDF. Um, and if we could come up with our own um, slightly, sim slightly uh, customized version of that, this is exactly what we might decide to call Quackle. Um, for the purpose of this. Um, we, um, we promised we would do some named entity recognition across the inscriptions, um, as I was describing a minute ago, and we would experiment with doing some reasoning on the RDF to see whether the kinds of statements that are made, the kinds of relationships between people, can be used to extract more information from them than was there as we started. So how have we, uh, how have we done so far? Well, we've um, achieved a few of these. Um, you may not be able to tell the difference there between the grey and the black ones, um, so building an ontology is done, cookbook version 1 is done, the lexicon, the Trismegistos, and PIR are all in the SNAP dataset. We're working on partner projects data, we don't have anything, we don't have uh, most of them in, in fully in SNAP format yet, but we're working on several. Um, we've made a start at identifying co-references, we're still um, in the process of encoding that so that that can be um, vis visible. Um, we've identified and specified what um, APIs and services um, we want to build, and we have a timeline for building them. The, the, the basics of the named entity recognition description has been done, and we haven't yet started reasoning on the RDF, but we've got five months left. Um, so that's pretty much where we stand on this year. Snap one was this, this year's um, work. Um, we then, um, we feel, I mean, that, that looks, I don't know you, that, that checklist looks pretty good for, for halfway through a project. Um, I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. So on the basis of that, we then intend to apply for funding to do further work. Um, and so in later um, projects, um, we intend to work on a few more aspects of the, um, of the, of the data set and to, to build on it in various ways. Um, so we, we would like to do more work on how um, searching for persons, whether by name, by date, or by various other kinds of information that's attached to persons, can be used as a research tool um, on this data set. Um, we want to do some work into ways in which searching um, and navigating the, the links that we have between persons and between names and between places and between the other kinds of information that we have in this graph um, can be used to form links between existing projects and existing databases so that, for example, um, now that we have in the database um, information not only about a LGPN person who has been ingested, um, but we also have information about that person who we've identified is the same person in Trismegistos and in three other data sets, plus about uh, family relatives of this person in a couple of other data sets that we've identified, and those persons are described in other um, databases, whether we can, the LGPN can go follow that graph along and find information in these other data sets that can enrich the LGPN data set and can be brought in either as a just as a dynamic um, search, or can actually be brought in and in, 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 ingested into their data set um, um, as is. Um, so, so this you know, crosswalking between, um, between the different um, crossbiographies. Um, we, um, we, we would very much like to do something similar to what Pelagios 
um, have done in the, um, in the second and third phase of their work, um, which is to build a harvester so that when people have, have encoded um, their own texts or archaeological records with SNAP identifiers, we can go out there and look at the, the RDF that they've used to record those annotations, and we can say this SNAP person has been mentioned or has been asserted to be mentioned in the following 12 texts, in the following three archaeological records, in the following two uh, coin catalogues, um, and so forth. So we can then start to have not only what information we have asserted about this person, but what information anyone else out there has asserted is about this person. Um, so just, it's just a simple harvester. Once, once people can make these assertions, let's see what assertions they make. Um, we, we would like to do more work on the, um, the last thing that Sebastian was talking about, which is annotating persons, being able to talk about what degrees of certainty or uncertainty you might have about those statements you're making, um, and possible, possibly recording disagreement between um, people who make such assertions. So I can make the assertion that this person is probably the sister of that person. I can say scholar so-and-so disagrees. Someone else can come along and give evidence for that disagreement and so forth. We, we, we haven't really fully specified how that was going to be done. That I think would be quite an important thing to do in the next phase. Um, of this project. Um, there's a significant amount of infrastructure and optimization work needs to be done, um, just as a simple um, issue that there are. Um, so for each of those pages of um, uh, uh, RDF that Sebastian showed you, um, that was the RDF for one person, and that RDF actually involved, since each RDF statement is a triple, it says this thing has this relationship to this thing, so it says this thing is a name, this name, or this thing is a person, this person has this name, this name can be expressed in text as this in Greek, this name can be expressed in text as this in Latin, this name can be expressed in text as this in... You start to see that this what looked like a relatively, I won't say simple, it was a page full of, of gibberish, but um, a relatively concise um, statement um, about this person is actually 20 RDF triples. Um, Multiply that by the three quarters of a million people we have already and the many more people we hope to ingest We then start to talk about multiple millions of, um, of triples and that's actually quite hard to ingest in a single database um, And have it have it return results um, Quickly without without um, computers exploding and so forth So, so there's some there's some um, optimization work that needs to be done on that and that, that's fairly urgent really um, and the other thing which I think is um, is a pretty compelling Thing which we would need to say in a later bid is we need to do much more um, actual co-reference identification, even of the basic kind, which is saying that this database is describing this person and this database is describing this person, and it's obvious because they're both using the same bibliographical reference. Well, one is using a URI for that bibliographical reference, the other is referencing it in plain text, and the third one might be referencing it in plain text but in a different language. Um, we, you know, we need to find um, more of those kinds of co-references. Um, we're again talking about millions of records we, you know, no human can go through and say, well, it's obvious those three are the same person. Any human could, um, or any human with some basic classical training could look at these three records and say, yes, they're the same person. But across millions and millions of records and how many different possible combinations of people there are, they just, they just can't. Um, so we're thinking of various um, methods that, that might work on this. Again, social network analysis might be one which could give us um, at least some, some preliminary filtering that would help us to... Um, uh, to, to know which, um, which candidate persons and, and candidate identifications to look at. Um, there are some ideas um, that I have about using crowdsourcing um, to do this. Um, so if we use some automated method to say, well, here's a bunch of very likely um, co-references, here's a bunch of slightly likely ones, here's a bunch of very unlikely ones, we could have the ones in the middle looked at by a crowd, the ones at the top looked at by experts, and the ones at the bottom discarded. Um, and so forth. So there could, there could be a crowdsourcing um, feature to that. And um, the, uh, the, the third possibility is by, by using RDF reasoning, whether we can actually look, um, you know, track some of the relationships that exist in the RDF already and see whether some of those relationships actually already imply identity or co-reference between individuals. So this, this is pretty much a, a wish list. We can't, we can't talk about how any of this, this stuff works yet, but this is, this is pretty much a wish list for what we'll be asking money for next year. So I'll, um, I'll stop there. Um, if you want to find out more, um, everything about this project is at this URL. There's both our blog and all of our reference information, and from there you can also get to our triple store um, 
and once we've got it standing up again, a Sparkle endpoint, um, which will allow you to query that triple store, and so forth. So um, at this stage, we're, we're extremely keen for um, feedback. So please, uh, please do leave comments and throw stones. And so forth. thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you for an extremely interesting seminar. It's, um, it's wonderful to, to hear how far you've already got and about all the plans you've got for, uh, for the future of the project, which is obviously taking in you know, enormous quantities of data. Um, I know there are going to be a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be. Um, but there's one thing I'd like to ask. Um, first, which is about the chronological spread of the project, because I noticed that you're obviously bringing in a lot of different data sets, some of which have uh, data from within what many of us would class as the ancient world, um, but also including data from well outside those, uh, those boundaries, even if you consider them to be quite wide. Um, via, for instance, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering whether in your plans for the future, there was any plan to... Uh, well, firstly, I wondered what your precise chronological spread of the project is currently. Um, and secondly, whether you would plan to expand that uh, in the future. Yes. Um, so, well, there's two ways to answer the first part of that, is what, what our precise chronological spread is. We could do a Sparkle query and see what, what dates are covered. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is but I suspect it's a relatively limited set of dates. Um, I mean, in fact, I suspect it's 8th century BC to 6th century CE, right? That's, um, that's what the three databases claim to cover. But um, our, um, our stated aim um, for uh, our criteria for inclusion is, um, so core classical Greco-Roman world data sets and immediately adjacent. So we include Hellenistic Babylon because the, the database is, I mean, by defining itself as Hellenistic, it's, it's specifically talking about adjacent to the, uh, the, the classical world at that time. Um, we include the Byzantine prosopographies because it's adjacent along another axis. Um, we won't, um, uh, we, uh, we include the, uh, the, the, the Ptolemaic and pre-Ptolemaic Egyptian um, prosopographies on the same, on the same basis. Um, we won't at this point include uh, Anglo-Saxon England um, because that's sort of two stages removed, both in time and in, and in, um, and in, in place. There's no direct um, connection. So that's, that's where we are sort of uh, in terms of our primary inclusion. Um, there's, it has been pointed out, and it's absolutely right, that there's no reason any of the, of the standards or the systems or the specifications we've defined here would be more suitable for classical texts and classical persons than they would be for Anglo-Saxon or 18th century German or contemporary medical records, for example. I mean, medical records have other kinds of complications. Um, but um, we, um, we wanted to test this on what is a fairly um, core and fairly well studied and well understood data set and actually pretty limited. Um, so although we will have millions of records, that's millions, not billions. Um, which is, you know, already a, a, a good thing. Um, and we, um, we, we do hope eventually to start, you know, expanding this along various different axes, geographic and chronological, um, as, um, as we go along. We, um, we may find at that point that the project um, is uh, completely out of our hands. Um, and so we're talking really about the standards expanding to those sort of... Um, uh, data sets rather than us working on those data sets. I've no particular desire to work on 18th century German historical records, um, nothing against that particularly, but um, the, um, but, but as I say, there's no reason why the standards wouldn't be useful for them. I mean, we very much hope they will, um, just for people who want to share the bare minimum data about their people across, across multiple data sets. But for the time being, we're sticking to the classical and immediately adjacent um, for, um, for precisely that reason. Now we will, as you say, include um, information extracted from VF, um, which includes um, so plenty, I mean, which, which will, by accident perhaps, include people who are from outside of the chronological or geographical range that we consider our core, um, but that's, um, 
that's in a sense by accident, and in a sense we don't we don't we don't want to work too hard to exclude it. I mean, if we end up if we say, well, find us anyone you've got from you know before 500 CE, um, that's fine. The vast majority of those are classical. It will also include some Chinese authors. You know, we don't, we don't want to go through and get rid of them just for the sake of it, um, because they might be useful to someone somewhere, and they're not really getting anyone's way. Um, likewise, we have um, uh, we were very much hoping to include the, um, the the database of Syriac saints, and the vast majority of Syriac saints are early Christian, are late antique, um, and um, and so pre pre seventh century, and so will um, will will completely fit or at least be adjacent. I think I think more than adjacent that they're within. The range of our of our data set, but the the, the the catalog of Syriac saints includes saints up to the 18th and 19th century. Um, but again, we don't want to go through and exclude them just for the sake of it, because they're not they're not doing any harm. So some people will get in who are outside of that outside of that range. But but that's the point. Thank you. Yeah. So, two questions. First of all, are you going to include Etruscan names, bearing in mind that's Italy prior to the Romans? And the second point is. Aren't your data, no, no, from no fault of your own, be a bit skewed because you're going to have a huge pile of number of names in Egypt because you've got papyrus, huge amount of papyrus evidence. You've got a large amount of mild inscriptions in Italy, so Rome will be very, very rich. Uh, Vindolanda and places in Northern England because of the personal, you know, the circumstances of conservation. You've got tablet inscription uh, conservation. You've got a large number of names at the end of the empire and in the middle. You've got large areas, maybe in France and Spain, where there's not so much, so you're going to get a distorted picture. Uh, because you're not going to get the name to be even around the empire, right? In terms of numbers. I don't want to get the impression that Snap, that snap, is, that snap is supposed to be a tool for, for people like you to use. It's not supposed to be something in itself. It's not trying to make a statement about. You, you wouldn't use that to say, oh, I wonder how many people were alive at 200. BC or anything like that. It's not. I, I don't think that. I don't think those biases really matter because that that's you know that it's inherent in our subject. It's it's representing what we've got. I mean the, the Etruscan name certainly. I mean if they come along. I, 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 but I don't. I don't think we're, tr we're not trying at this point for comprehensiveness. No, and, and we can never be more comprehensive than the the prosopographies that exist out there. We're not we're not creating new data. So it may be there's a large hole in the data which archaeological research could actually fill, um, and and maybe this data set will help to identify that hole, and someone will go out and do that research. But our, our job is not to create any new prosopography. So so the short answer is yes, the data is skewed. Um, all our data around the ancient world is skewed, right? I mean, it's skewed in a sense because the prosopography of the um, of the Roman Empire. Um, is only interested in people who are equites and higher, right? Um, it's um, it's skewed um, because people are much more interested in Italy than they are in um, ancient Spain or or ancient um, uh, Armenia, say. Um, and so much more has been published on, on those things. Um, yes, I'm not, but, I'm, but I'm not sure we can. No, no, I, I, it's, I'm I don't. Snap. I'm just saying no, no, sure, the nature sure. of the archaeology. Yeah. Yes, we've got a huge amount of Egypt, huge amount of Italy, yeah. huge amount of maybe yeah. of Egypt, all the but they're all in, yes. in Spain. Now. So yes, know, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, and that's and that's true. Um, and it's true, I think, of 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 all. I mean, that's true of all classical scholarship. I think. Yeah. Um, and I would I would like to to think that this would actually help to to to, to point those sort of problems out. Um, it's, I mean, if you compare it with, with Via from the modern world, you think, oh, that, that's got, a million, it got millions and millions of people. And it turns out the only reason they're there, they wrote something, which is a pretty mm -hmm. <laughs> skewed way of thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get the impression about Via, by the way, even just all of Via. It's a very, very small subset of it. Yeah. I was just going to say, adding to what Gabby said, I think one of the things we hope is while well, we've started off with some of the big data sets, one of the things we really hope is that we'll provide a nice way of getting the small data sets in. So where you do have small groups that are working in these areas that are not as big, this might hopefully provide a way to get them to bring the data together so that you can actually start getting more on the Roman Spain or Roman Armenia or whatever else. Because if you've got lots of small disparate groups working who don't necessarily have the opportunity to talk to each other, then you're not going to have the opportunity to get these links being made. Whereas one of the hopes is that we will provide a way for those groups to make those links. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to briefly touch upon that. I mean, in some of the fields we don't have uh, protocographies mm -hmm. and we don't have digital information. 
So will the Snapdragon enable those people and those researchers to? Um, well, if you if can encourage people to take the name information, the personal information they have, and put it into something like a prosopography, and put it into something of, of some kind of digital format. And if you've seen the digital formats we already have are very, very varied. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a full, um, you know, lexicon Greek personal names style richness, which has, you know, taken 42 years to get where it is. Um, um, then, then yes, I'm, I mean, we can't, we can't help them to do it in the sense that we can't provide them with a database and go out and do the work for them, but we, um, if, if they do it, we can certainly, um, we can certainly encourage and you know, try and take advantage of that. Certainly, yes, we'd, we'd certainly be interested in the prosper data data from, uh, from, from your text, for example. Yeah. Um, we do run workshops and things on occasion. Mm -hmm. We did one at DH, and yeah. we are available for you know, that sort of discussion and possibly yeah. in the future more things like that can yeah. happen. We run a number of things where people have been able to come and bring their data and spreadsheets mm -hmm. or whatever, That's and true. then yeah. we've gone through mm -hmm. with them these are the steps mm -hmm. that you will need to do to get your data yeah. and the form it can be ingested. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I'm going to ask something about it, all this. It, it sounds like what you need is for Snapdragon in some form to be uh, sort of exist permanently. So, how mm -hmm. does that fit in with the kind of funding regimes we've got at the the yeah. Moment. yeah. No, that is that is a good point. Um, the um, and that's that's an issue with I think every every project that's ever existed, not only digital. Um, but I think um, well, Sebastian may have more to say about this. But I think the short the short answer is, for the moment, it's fairly fragile. If we if we all stop working on it because we lose interest or we, we don't get any funding and our day jobs mean we can't spend too much time on it. Um, and our, um, our institutions, you know, no longer receiving money towards system administration say, well, we're not going to support this massive triple store, um, the thing might well disappear. Um, after this has been, we've been working on this for a couple more years and we've got much more data in there and this is becoming valuable and other people are working on it, we'll start to see much more robustness in, in terms of, you know, potential backups, potentially putting the data somewhere where it doesn't depend on a single institution. Um, and. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, if, if we six people running this project are all flying to the same conference and, and crash into the sea, um, other people will take it up because it's, you know, it's an important um, project. So I think the, 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 the short answer is, you're right, it's very fragile right now. Um, but I think, I think this, this is true for everything. In some ways it doesn't matter. It, if if you refer to SNAP person 6758, that, that is worthwhile in itself, if we all talk that language, even if there is no database somewhere which tells you what that thing is. Um, but the, I think it's also important to say that, that, that Snapdragon as it stands is caching data, it's not owning it, it's not a repository. So if, if the database of Etruscan names gets together all its stuff, contributes RDF. It's not. It's not pushing it to us. It's giving. It's, it's putting a copy of it in there as, a, as, a, as an as an index. Mm -hmm. So the primary responsibility for those for those statements about Etruscan names remains back with the Etruscan name people. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is much wider, actually. And yeah. If you said if you said let's have a place where we're, where we're gathered together at all, so you can stop maintaining your LGP and your Trismegistos, that would be gigantic fun, but. Uh, but but we can't, we don't even proposing to do that. And if, even if we were to disappear, as you say, if one of the things we achieve by doing this is the crosswalking of, of information, mm -hmm. so we give SNAP identifiers to uh, 300,000 people from the LGPN, we give SNAP identifiers to 400,000 people from Trismegistos, mm -hmm. and um, we also link a few hundred of those people who are in both databases, or maybe a few thousand of people who are in both databases, um, you will both immediately be aware of that, and the LGPN will at some point include in their record of this, this person exists in Trismegistos database. The Trismegistos will include the information, this person has a, an LGPN identifier. Um, this means that even if SNAP were to disappear, all the SNAP identifiers in all those would no longer be dereferenceable, um, but they would um, they would still be meaningful, um, but in any case, 
they would also have, as well as a SNAP identifier, they'd also have an LGBN identifier. And so a lot of those relationships um, would have come about through this sort of through this sort of collaboration. I think that would be um, um, also already because we're using the the standards that we are. It's all at the very bottom text, human yeah. well, yeah. semi-human readable text. Mm -hmm. So you know, if the worst comes to the worst, then we can output the base files, put them on BitTorrent as Roman or G .avi, and release them to the world. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, and so even if you know it gets taken offline, the base information can be passed around to everybody, and then maybe in a year later, or you know at some other point, somebody will be able to recreate where we were without you know loss, as it were. We we don't need to worry about proprietary things falling over and no longer reading the files or anything. Well. Assuming things still read text files, but yes. that, that's a, that, that's about as basic as you can get with an electronic document. Well, one of the one of the tests for is this data really in an open format? Is um, is this data still useful outside of not only outside of the software you're talking about, outside of the format you're talking about? Would this data still be meaningful if written on on a napkin? Um, and to some degree, to some degree, it is. We're saying this LGPN record is a person. You know, those sorts of references are still meaningful completely outside of the digital format that they're in.